I would like for you to open up your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 10. We're going to be in verses 1 through 17 this morning in a message entitled uh, Radical Redemption. And we've been carrying on in this theme of of radical, and the reason we pursue this idea of radical is because as we open up, um, especially this book, but, but all of the books of the New Testament, we see these people passionately chasing after uh, Jesus Christ, forsaking uh, almost everything that they have, in some cases, even their lives, uh, to chase after him. And the question that arises is, why would they do that? And the answer to that question is very simple, the redemption that, that has been granted to them. And what is redemption? Redemption. redemption means to be purchased back. Uh, purchased back from what? Well, in our case, to be purchased back from sin. The, the Bible tells us that uh, the wages of sin is death and that every man, woman, and child has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And for that uh, redemption to take place, that means a payment had to be made. And the payment that had to be made was blood. And not just any blood, but perfect blood. And that perfect blood resided in the body and in the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning we're going to talk about this radical uh, redemption and how it is a gift. It is a gift that has been given to us by Jesus Christ. And and I want to ask you a question just to open up. Have you ever received a gift that not only brightened your day, but radically changed your life? You know, I'm standing here in front of these boxes, and and I know that it's a difficult concept to grasp that one of these boxes may radically change a life. But the the fact of the matter is that it could. Because not only are there gifts contained in there, not only is there candy, but the gospel is going to come with it. It's going to come with it in literature. It's going to come with it in in the fact that a child's going to open it up and know that somebody somewhere around the world cares about them. And it's going to come with a missionary who delivers this box to some kid. And, And I don't know about you, but I have received gifts like that. It wasn't in the form of a box. It wasn't uh, in the form of a toy or candy. The gift that I received, I received when I was 17 years old. I was a high school senior and getting ready to start my um, uh, senior year of football. And, And let me just be honest with you. I was a mediocre football player, okay? Um, I was, uh, I was on a very good team and uh, my role on that team was, in my view, not really that essential. I was an offensive lineman, and I wasn't even the best offensive lineman on our team. But during the course of that season, um, my coach came to me, and um, he told me that he wanted me to be one of the team captains. Now, this completely caught me off guard because I am like the least likely person on that team to be a captain. There are guys who had uh, Division I schools coming and offering them scholarships, and I was not one of them, okay? I was not the biggest. I was not the, I might have been the fattest, but I was not the fastest Uh, Not the quickest, not the strongest, Uh, but my coach says to me, you know, Mike, there's a lot more to being a captain than than, uh, physical ability. And so he asked me to be captain, and I thought, yeah, that'd be cool. I'll be captain. But that gift that he gave to me uh, was one that uh, not only made a a mediocre player a above-average player, Um, because of the encouragement that it provided for me, but it allowed me to see myself in a way that I never saw myself before. I never saw myself as a leader. I was one that will pour 100% effort into something, but as far as leading men, I, I never thought I would do anything like that. But this coach, Coach Paul Culver, saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And it was this gift that, uh, that drew out of me um, something that I didn't know even resided within me. And as I thought about that, I thought about that's the exact same thing that redemption does for us. You see, radical redemption is secured totally and wholly uh, by Jesus' finished work on the cross. But one thing that it does is that it transforms a heart. It draws out that which lies underneath. And uh, I don't know about you, but as for me, what Jesus has done for me, 
And, and uh, not, on, not only in um, going to a cross and dying, but looking on me and saying, I see something of value and something of worth. And I see something more than that. I see something that I want to use to advance my kingdom. That is something that just uh, radically changed my life. And in this passage, in Romans chapter 10, what we're going to see is this radical redemption has a lot less to do with how sincere we are and it has a lot more to do with Jesus' substitutionary atonement and this contagious affection for him that follows. So let's dive in. We're going to first look at these uh, uh, misguided and even um, misplaced sincere actions. Uh, let's look at uh, verse 1 through 4. And the word of God says this, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that is from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So what we have a picture here is this. We have uh, two means of salvation. And you might think, oh, that's heresy, Mike. And um, you're, you're partly right. But there are two means of salvation. One is possible and one is impossible. And here, here they are. Here's the impossible. You can be saved if you live a perfect life from the moment that you're born to the time that you die. That is one means of salvation. It is impossible but there's one means of salvation. The other means of salvation comes totally, wholly, and solely through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And you see, the problem is religion says, I can earn the favor of God. And that is what the Jewish nation began to do. And this is what Paul is alluding to here. He says, my heart's desire and prayer for the Israelites is that they may be saved, for they are zealous for God. But they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. So they made it up as they go along. And that is at the heart of every human religion on the face of the earth. What can we do to please a just and holy God? And let's just start making stuff up. And that's what they do. And, then, and you get down to the core, basic fundamentals of each of the faiths. It is a works-based theology that says, if I do these things, then God loves me best. And he loves me more than you. And he owes me. The truth of the matter is God owes us nothing. And we can sincerely believe that we have done all of the right things and we have given enough money and we have served enough and believed the right things and be sincerely wrong. And that is what Paul was saying about the Jewish nation in his day. He's saying, they are zealous. And I will testify to the fact that they are zealous for what they believe. They are not lukewarm. They are not uh, uh, impassionate. They are zealous. They are excited, but they are wrong. Have you ever been in that place where you have been really excited about something, but just totally off base? I mean, I think about some of the things that religion causes people to do. Religion causes people to look down their nose at other people. Religion causes some people to strap bombs to their back and walk into the middle of crowded places and blow themselves up. That's zeal, but not based in knowledge. That's to uh, understand a form of righteousness that men have made up, but not understand the righteousness that God has made up. The, the righteousness that God has given us is a, is a righteousness that is not of our own. It is a righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ alone. And in this passage, we see that since sincerity does not lead to redemption as much as knowing and responding to the truth does. We can be sincere all we want. And, I, and I've heard that over the course of my 12-year ministry. Well, they're really sincere people. But he's cheating on his wife. He is really sincere people, but he robs his neighbor. Okay? Uh, sincerity is not the measure of redemption. It's knowing the truth and responding to it. See, because here's the flip side of the coin so to speak. You know, we can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. But on the opposite side of that same coin is we can know the truth and not respond to it. 
Right? It's not enough for us to come to church and fill our heads full of Bible knowledge and then never respond to it. In fact, I think maybe that may be more wicked than being sincerely wrong and responding in kind. Why, why would I say that? I would say that because if we know the truth, we claim to know the God that this Bible talks about, we claim to love Jesus and then say, ah, I'm just gonna do my own thing. That is to disgrace his name and to um, minimize the sacrifice, the redemption that has been purchased for you. And I think about uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse 26 through 33, and it's the story that you guys are familiar with. It's the story of the 12 uh, spies who go into the land. See, God has told the, the Jewish nation uh, as they're, uh, ta he's taking them out of Egypt and he takes them up to, just to the, to the brink of the promised land. And he says, I'm going to lead you into a land that is flowing with milk and honey. This place is going to be a blessing to you. You're going to have vineyards you didn't plant. You're going to live in houses you did not live in. All you have to do is trust me. So the Israelites say, okay, we're going to send in 12 spies, one from each tribe, and they're going to bring back a report uh, on whether we can do it. So they send in these 12 spies. And you know what the scripture says. It says 10 of them come back with an evil report. It says, oh, there are giants in the land. And they make us look like grasshoppers. And there's no way that we can conquer them. They have fortified cities. Wait a minute. God had just said, I am going to give you this land. Now, these men who were spies, they sincerely believed the things they believed. They sincerely believed that these giants were huge. They sincerely believed that these, these uh, cities that were fortified were impenetrable. Okay? They sincerely believed it, but they were sincerely wrong. But there were two, only two. It comes back and says, if God is on our side, what do we have to fear? If he has said this is going to be done, then we're just going to chase after him. And those two men were the only two of their generation that survived the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and the only two who were able to experience the blessing of the promised land. And the reason that I mention this is I, I think we do the same thing. I think we do the same thing. God makes some tremendous promises. And I think... Um, in the sincerity of our hearts, we, we want to believe what this book says. But just because we sincerely believe it doesn't mean that we know the truth and respond to it. Because that's part of the deal. Not just knowing, but responding. It's kind of like a, a football team. Your favorite football team when you go home, if you're a Vikings fan, I apologize. You'll probably be disappointed this afternoon. But... It would be like this. You go home and you flip on Fox and uh, the Vikings huddle up and, and they got the ball on the five yard line. The other team had just turned the ball over and, and, and the players are all excited. They're patting each other on the back. The quarterback kneels down in the huddle and he calls the play. They break uh, the huddle and then they sprint to the sideline and do nothing. You think like, that, that doesn't make any sense. Well, they were sincerely excited that they got the ball back, but uh, to do something about it, to push the ball across the end zone, I mean, they might even be excited about the play. They might think, Coach, that's the greatest play that's ever been called, and, and I think our quarterback can really do that, but unless they line up and they do it, it doesn't matter how sincere you really are. And I want to ask you this question this morning. Do you measure your commitment to Christ by your good intentions? Or do you measure your commitment to Christ by your God-inspired actions? Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not your works that save you. But it's the salvation that you received ought to inspire you to believe God for great things in your life. Believe that God wants to do things in and through you. Yeah, you, the guy who blows it every two seconds. Yeah, you, the woman who feels like she's a failure when she looks in the mirror, the God of the universe looks into your eyes and says, you're mine, and I want to use you. And I want to ask you this question. Do you sincerely believe that? Do you believe that God wants to use you? I mean, more than that, more than sincerity, do you know that that's the truth, and have you responded to it? But the scripture goes on and says, 
In verse 5, 5 through 13, Paul picks up on the theme of Jesus' substitutionary atonement. It says, Moses writes 